The following is a listener supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. Welcome to another week of Grace in Focus. We are just delighted that you are joining us today as we begin a new study in the book of 1 Peter. As you may know, the book of 1 Peter challenges us relationally in about five different areas. So I hope you'll stay with us and join us for the next five or six episodes as we go through this book. Philippe Sterling will take the lead as Ken Yates and Bob Wilkin also join in. The Grace Evangelical Society has a great website, faithalone.org. Hope you'll go there and find out about our resources, many ways that we can be of help to you as you pursue free grace theology and ideas. We have just tons of material on our website, articles, books, blogs, videos, and you can subscribe to our magazine, Grace in Focus. It's a free subscription if you live in the lower 48 United States. And if you live in some other place, it's also accessible through our website, faithalone.org. It's not far away. The Grace Evangelical Society's National Conference 2023 is happening May 22nd through the 25th, and we want you to come and join us. It will take place this year on the grounds of Camp Copus in Denton, Texas. Here's Bob Wilkin with a descriptive word about what you can expect. The teaching that we get at the annual conference for Grace Evangelical Society is so meaningful to me. I'm always encouraged to hear pastors and theologians and missionaries who are talking about the scriptures and talking about their walk with Christ. I'm always moved when I hear these messages. Thank you, Bob. And friend, we invite you to go to our website, faithalone.org, to get more details and to register for this year's national conference happening May the 22nd through the 25th. That's faithalone.org. Now, Bob, Ken, and Philippe to begin our discussions in 1 Peter. Welcome back to Grace in Focus, and I'm here with Ken and a special guest, uh, Pastor Philippe Sterling. Hello, Philippe. Hello, Bob and Ken. Hey, how you doing? Uh, we were at Dallas Theological Seminary together, and I majored in New Testament. Philippe majored in Old Testament. So he was the smart guy. He really had to be either brave or very smart or both <laughs> major in Old Testament. Or very stupid. <laughs> there you go. That's, that fits. Yeah, I thought the Old Testament department was particularly tough. But anyhow, uh, Philippe is here not to talk this time about the Old Testament, but to talk about First Peter. So maybe you could get us started on the introduction to the book. Sure. Even though I was an Old Testament major, you know, I kept running into people at DCS that says, if you can, always be sure to take a class with, with Zen Hodges. Mm -hmm. So finally, you know, I had on, and the class that Zen was offering happened to be on First and Second Peter and on Jude. And I took that, and I was just, just fascinated. The content of the book, the theme of the books also struck me very much for my own personal Christian life and, and how I was to view my, my journey as a believer in this world and as a, a servant of God. And I had the opportunity, even right after taking the class, of being accepted to teach a lay institute class at oh. DTS that was open to the community. You know, graduating students were given the opportunity to apply and to teach, teach a class. And I taught first and second Peter. Oh, and, that's oh that sounds and, like a lot of fun. And then, of course, in my ministry as a pastor, I've preached to it a couple of times. I've used it in a Bible class. I've used it even in a small group situation. So I find myself coming back over and over. Okay, before we get to the major sections, maybe you could tell us a bit about the readers. Who was Peter? And I assume you're taking this as written by Peter since it's called First Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, the very first line of the book is, you know, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he identifies himself as Peter using the name that Jesus gave to him when, right. when Andrew, his brother, you know, brought him to Jesus. In John 1, 42, we read, and Jesus looked at him and says, you know, you, your name is, is Simeon, but you shall be Peter, which means stone. And ah. that will have some significance even in, in this book, because Peter is later going to refer to his readers, to believers as living stones ah, yeah. and to Christ as the cornerstone. And so he calls himself an apostle, one sent by Jesus. And then he identifies the people that he's writing to. I'm writing to those who are the, the chosen sojourners, the chosen pilgrims 
of God and Christ and the Spirit in this world. And then he says, you are the ones of the dispersion. And then he names the places of Pontus, of Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And those are Roman provinces in the northern part of the country we call Turkey today. And by the way, that's a portion that Paul didn't go to. Ah. And then later on, we learned that Paul identified Peter as the apostle to the Jews, and he himself as the apostle to the Gentiles, and that he didn't want to build on where someone else had built. So it's very possible that Peter, we do know that he, he did go out, because Paul will tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, that Peter could take along a believing wife when, whereas, he, would travel, uh, when, yeah. when he would travel about. Now, yeah. by the way, I noticed you said elect sojourners or elect pilgrims. The Greek doesn't really say what many English translations say, which is they move elect down to verse 2 right. and say elect according to foreknowledge, and they make this some kind of statement about election to eternal life, which I don't think there is such a thing. But in any case, this is just saying God chose these people to be pilgrims. Yeah, exactly. Pilgrim. Right. In fact, the, the word elect in the Greek text will occur right before sojourners of right. the dispersion. So as it modifies sojourners of the dispersion. It right. just simply mean that we come to believe, not that we're chosen to believe, but we come to believe. But according to God's foreknowledge, he determines the course of our path, where we're sent, where we go, where right. we're born even. And so these people were to view themselves as, as sojourners, but yet that God had put them where they happened uh, He chose to them be. to be sojourners. He chose them to be sojourners. And right. while they were literal sojourners, in a sense, we're all figuratively sojourners yeah. because this life is not our ultimate home. Yeah, we're, we're citizens of heaven, pilgrims and, and sojourners on this earth. So the question is, how are we to conduct ourselves if we view ourselves as sojourners how are we to conduct ourselves in, in well, this Well, before world? we go on, is your view then that he is writing for Jewish believers, as Peter is the apostle to the Jews, or do you see this more broad, including both? Well, of course, there's three possibilities. Sure. No, that he's writing to Jewish believers, <laughs> right. that he's writing to Gentile believers, or he's writing to a combination of Jewish and, and Gentile believers. Now, it's interesting, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter gave his first sermon and everything, of the Hellenistic Jews that were there. They're specifically mentioned there are some from Pontus and Cappadocia. And we're told as a result of Peter's first you know, sermon that 3,000 came to, to believe and then presumably went back to their areas. And those many believers, there were probably many that went back to Pontus and Galatia and, and formed fellowships you know, there began to worship, began to share their faith, see people come to know Christ, both Jewish and Gentile people, much as was occurring in Judea and Jerusalem. Of course, we know of in Caesarea, Cornelius. And so also it's possible that Peter had actually later on made a journey to that area with his wife, with his believing wife, and perhaps had been involved in helping to plant further churches and encourage and exhort the believers there. So I, I think there were a combination of Jewish and Gentile believers. Later on in the book, you know, he talks about, you know, the feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. And that wouldn't be a typical way of describing Jewish people. Right. That is a typical way of describing you know, Gentiles, right. too. All right. And what about this theme of the saving of the soul? That comes up in what, verse 9? Is that it? Uh, yeah, verse 9 specifically will culminate the prologue, which is verses 3 through to 12. Here, and that's how shall we live? Yeah, how shall we live? Verses 3 to 5, he talks about our new birth and how our new birth has set before us the hope of a glorious inheritance. And by the way, this is a reference much like the new birth that Jesus talks about, John 3, with Nicodemus. So we believe in we're born again. And that new birth sets before us the hope of a glorious inheritance. And that hope of that glorious inheritance is one of the major things that can motivate us to triumph over our trials. And he introduces immediately the matter of our trials here. Later, he'll develop that in terms of the suffering we may experience because we're believers in this world. There's a difference between an inheritance and being born again. An inheritance is a reward. Yeah. And we obtain that inheritance 
based upon how we live, how we serve the Lord during this life. Yes, and that will deal with a little bit of our understanding of the salvation of the soul. That right. is not a soteriological. It doesn't deal with how we obtain eternal life. Right. But it is with the matter of our sanctification, our development, our growth, how we live our life in such a way that it's valuable to God and results in an inheritance, actually it's building up an inheritance as we live it out. Eternal life is guaranteed once you believe, but this inheritance is not. Right. And is the saving of the soul more or less the same as the inheritance? Uh, yes. The saving of the soul is basically the preservation of life experience that is pleasing to God and that is rewarded by him as an inheritance. Ultimately, that inheritance is to share in the glory of Christ, particularly his, his rule over the millennial kingdom and ultimately over a new heaven and, and a new earth. And we see that in Matthew 16, 24 to 20, and Mark 8, 34 to th- yeah, 34 through 38. 38. And that's where Jesus talks about saving your life, but yeah. it's this Greek word psuche, yeah. saving your soul or losing your psuche. The preservation of a valuable life that is rewardable by God is brought out through the various relationships that we have in life. Our relationship with our God, our Heavenly Father, our relationship with the family of God, with the brethren, our relationship with the world around us, and then our experience in this world because we're believers that may lead to suffering. But that's valuable to God as well. And mm-hmm. all of those are sections in this book. Right, exactly. So the, that's the, books, the structure saying. of the book divides out into those sections. that We can think about them in terms of concentric circles that the book develops the ideas. Great. Yeah. It's great to get an overview of the book like that, Philippe. We appreciate it and to see the structure. And so next time, we will talk about that first one, which is our relationship with the Father. Keep grace in focus. Bob Wilkins' great book, The Ten Most Misunderstood Words in the Bible, is available half price right now in the GES bookstore, faithalone.org. Go there and use the code word MISUNDERSTOOD for 50% off through March the 31st, 2023. Did you miss an episode of Grace in Focus that you really wanted to hear? Just come to faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We have all our past episodes right there on the site. In addition, we have all kinds of free resources available for you. It's all designed to help you mature and grow in your understanding of Scripture. So come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On this program, we keep our requests for financial partners to a minimum. But if you are interested in becoming a financial partner with Grace in Focus, you can find out how to do that at faithalone.org. Our team is really great about answering questions, comments, and feedback. If you've got some, we hope to hear from you. Let me give you our email address so you can do just that. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, we will continue in 1 Peter looking at your life of service to the Lord and how are you using the freedom that He has given you. Join us next time on Grace in Focus. This is the Grace Evangelical Society. Until next time, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.